Thank you, Tony. Uh, I want to welcome everybody here. We have a wonderful group here. I also want to thank Tony Tarazas. He's the one that always manages to put all this stuff together at the last minute. So if everybody would give Tony a nice hand. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I would like to give a background to everybody as to uh, later on who the Tuskegee Airmen were, but how it came to pass. There were a lot of critical people early on that without them, it wouldn't have happened. And I'm here because I'm the painter of the big mural behind us. Um, thank you. And I did that because I was approached by a gentleman named Bob Williams. And he is the fellow that's kneeling down on the Mustang up there. Uh, he was in the 100th Fighter Group flying Mustangs. Uh, he got two victories uh, in the early 50s. He decided to write a screenplay. And the screenplay, 43 years later, got produced as HBO's Tuskegee Airmen. And he came to me with the idea of doing the mural. Six months into the whole thing, he passed away. Uh, several other people took up the whole thing and miraculously got it all together and we did this and it was at LAX Terminal 3 for 16 months and we brought it back here, it's permanently here now and we hope to have many more of these things honoring the Tuskegee Airmen especially while we still have Tuskegee Airmen with us and in that regard I would like to have our Tuskegee Airmen who are with us today stand up so you can see who they are. So. You guys stand up. Jesse Burns, Dr. Robert Hedenbacher, known to all of us as the Rocky, and Mitch Hedenbacher. And just a little background here, Rusty, with the white shirt on there, uh, the real handsome one. Uh, he was the first one I painted on the mural up in that corner up there, sitting in the Thunderbolt. And uh, Rocky Higginbotham is right over here down at the bottom, kind of looking that way. And Mitch is, where to go? Mitch is up there, the third end on the top going that way. Uh, so they're all up there. So afterwards, if you want to talk to Tuskegee Airmen about anything you have in your mind about what they did and everything, feel free, because these guys really like to talk. <laughs> well, going way back in time, uh, like I said, there were some critical people that without them, it never would have happened. Or it would have happened much, much later, but it wouldn't happen in World War II. Uh, one person who kind of set the stage for everything that was going to happen later on was a fellow named Eugene Bullard. Uh, he grew up in the South, very segregated South, uh, very... Uh, mean South in a lot of ways, and he was forced to leave home at the age of eight. He wandered all over the place, he lived with gypsies, he tended horses, he became a jockey. Eventually, he stowed away on a German freighter and wound up in Aberdeen, Scotland, because his whole plan was to get to Paris. Uh, from Aberdeen, he became a welterweight fighter, got to England, did the circuit of welterweight fighting around there, got some meat on his bones. Uh, World War I broke out. Uh, at that point, he, he did get himself to Paris. He was too young to join, uh, so he had to wait a little bit and get some more meat on his bones and everything. Uh, the day he turned 19, he joined the French Foreign Legion in the 170th Infantry. He wound up being in every major battle there was, and he seemed to collect a lot of wounds in the process. He got wounded very seriously where the doctor said, well, you're never going to walk again. And at that point, when he was convalescing, an American friend showed up and had a nice talk with him, and betting $2,000 that he couldn't heal up and join the Lafayette Flying Corps. A few months later, he was in the Lafayette Flying Corps, $2,000 richer. For uh, three and a half months, he flew Newport 27s and reportedly also SPADs. Shot down two Germans, of which he got credit for one because the other one crashed behind enemy lines. But he was the first black pilot, first black fighter pilot, the first black pilot, period. And until then, everybody had been told they could fly airplanes. And all of a sudden, one of theirs was flying airplanes. 
and it kind of started changing the tone of everything. Unfortunately for him, three and a half months into the whole thing, he took leave, went to Paris. On the way back, it was raining. A French army truck pulled up. He started to climb into the back. This big black boot came and kicked him out. Being an ex welterweight boxer, he couldn't help himself. He started to climb back in. And when that boot came at him again, he grabbed it, and the person inside the boot yanked him out into the mud and pummeled the guy. The guy turned out to be a French officer. So instead of a summary court martial and a firing squad, because he was semi-famous at the point, they just put him back in the 170th Infantry. He survived the whole ordeal of World War I. He died of old age in Harlem in 1961. A very few short years later, there was this young lady named Bessie Coleman. And this is Bessie Coleman. Uh, she had heard about Eugene Bullard. She always wanted to do something different and really be something. She managed in 1920, late, to get over to France. She had just enough money to where she was able to go through flight school. She got her wings in March of 21. Came back to the U.S. and upon landing at the U.S., she was greeted by throngs and all kinds of press. It just astounded her. So very quickly she went back to France, got some more flying experience because she realized that she was kind of in the spotlight. She came back and she flew all over the states for five years. She had to fly to borrowed Curtis Jennings. Uh, she wasn't a very big person, but to a whole lot of young kids, all of a sudden the thought of flight entered their minds. And she flew successfully doing air shows, breaking down barriers. She had done one year of college before she had run out of uh, money. And this was a college in Texas that was segregated. They wanted her to come and perform, do her flying, give a lecture. She said she'd only do it if everybody came through the same entrance. And the school agreed to it. So she did break down some barriers. But the most important thing is, uh, she put it in the young, some young girls' minds that, yeah, you can do this. Unfortunately for her, uh, 1926 in Florida, uh, she was one of those that uh, if the jumper didn't show up for the air show, she'd strap on the parachute and make the parachute jumps. She knew she was going to have to make a jump the next day. She went up with her mechanic in the Jenny. She unbuckled her seatbelt to check out where she was supposed to jump into the next morning. And the mechanic was flying the airplane, he stalled it out, it went into a spin and she was thrown out. The Jenny spun in and the mechanic was killed too. But she had done what she was put on earth to do at that point. Uh, Fifteen years later, we had a lot of those little kids that had seen her become Tuskegee Airmen. So she was one of those critical people. Um, another very critical person was a fellow named Alfred Chief Anderson. The chief happened a little bit later. Uh, he had gone through flight school by, well actually he had soloed himself, because nobody else would do it. Uh, he only crashed into a tree once in the process. He did eventually get his pilot's license. Uh, he continued on doing the flying he could. He had some reversals of fortune, but along the way, before the reversals really caught up with him, a German World War I pilot, Ernest Buell, took him under his wing and got him to the point where he became a certified uh, air transport rated pilot. So he technically could fly with the airlines. That was a first for a black person. And it got to be known all over the place that Alfred Anderson became you know, the, the best pilot in the black community at that time and a lot better than a lot of white guys. But the reversal of the fortune happened. He literally got to the point where he was digging ditches. And one day down at the bottom of the ditch, and this is a good life lesson, he's actually at the bottom of this ditch with shovel in hand. This guy peers over into the ditch and says, are you Alfred Anderson? And he said, yeah. And he said, get out of there. And pulled him up out of the thing. This other guy's name is Dr. Forsyth. Dr. Forsyth uh, had gotten schooling in Montreal, Canada. He was an American. He'd done quite well. And he had heard about Alfred Anderson. He got him up out of that hole, uh, bought an airplane. Alfred Anderson taught Dr. Forsyth how to fly. They bought a really nice monocoupe and started breaking the records. And both of them became very famous. They flew all over the Bahamas, which was a first to Cuba, Santa Domingo, 
uh, eventually crashing the airplane because every place they went there, there were no airports, runways, or anything. They were landing where they could, and it eventually caught up with them. Uh, many years later, and with Alfred Anderson having about 3,500 hours of flying time already, he was hired by Tuskegee Institute when the Institute decided that some of their students were going to have a little flying course down there. So he became the chief instructor, and the name stuck at that point, Chief Anderson. He brought his airplanes with him, which were Piper Cubs. Uh, our Piper Cubs over in the Navy hangar right now. Looked exactly like that, same yellow with the black stripe on it and everything. At the very same point that all this was taking place, and they were beginning to have a real flight program at Tuskegee Institute, the military was beginning to get interested. The war looked like it was going to happen. They needed more pilots. The military was bogged down trying to, take, uh, to teach pilots. They instituted the civilian pilot training program. With that, schools were supposed to become part of that and start teaching their students and other civilians primary training. Then the military would train over or turn over the thing, and they'd start flying T-6s for advanced training. But the first training would be in Piper Cubs or Stearmans. It was just to get the guys to where they basically knew how to fly. Uh, Tuskegee was scheduled to be one of those, but there was a lot of foot dragging involved by the military. They weren't really sure. This is when Eleanor Roosevelt shows up. Uh, she belonged to a foundation that uh, she was on the board. They had annual meetings. She arranged to have this meeting this year at Tuskegee Institute because they had a really world-renowned infantile paralysis unit there. Because of Franklin, she wanted to check it out. So while she was there going through the whole thing, uh, seeing their whole infantile paralysis unit, one of the doctors said, have you heard about our young people that are learning to fly and getting their wings? They said, no. So very rapidly they got out to the airfield. There are photos of her standing there with Chief Anderson and a few of the students. There was one uh, young lady who had already gotten her license. Uh, they're all standing around and her Secret Service people were all there and everything. And, uh, she literally said, I always heard that you people couldn't do things like fly. And she's looking at us, she says, I see that you can do it just fine. And Chief Anderson was saying, yeah, we can. So at that moment she said, I want you to take me for a ride. Her Secret Service kind of fell to the ground and picked themselves up and came over. And the head guy of Secret Service said, man, you can't do that. And she turned to him in typical Eleanor Roosevelt fashion and said, you don't tell the first lady she can't do anything. So she went over to the Piper Cub with Chief Anderson, climbed into the back seat. He climbed in the front, they got propped, and they went flying. And 45 minutes later, they came back in and landed, and she said she had a very delightful 45 minute ride. And you know, when she got home to DC, she started poking Franklin in the ribs. You gotta do this, you gotta do this. He had just signed a thing a couple months before that that. Um, one of the, the key people, because he was the father, Benjamin O'Davis Sr., the father of Benjamin O'Davis Jr. up there, had been languishing as a colonel in the army. And he'd been a colonel for, I think, eight years at that point. And he had nine months to go before he had to retire. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, at that point, signed a little thing, and he became Brigadier General, finally. And when he became Brigadier General, he could pick his own staff. His first choice for his staff was his son, Benjamin O'Davis Jr., who at that point had gone through that whole thing of West Point with the four years of the silent treatment. Nobody acknowledging Benjamin O'Davis Jr. existed while he was at West Point. And in spite of that, he wound up, was it number 37? 37 in a class of 265? So he, he excelled at West Point in spite of the fact that he was completely ignored and a lot of times very rudely, but he did it. And you know, it's kind of like showing that you're better than everybody else just by doing really good. So all of a sudden, Benjamin Davis Sr. was Brigadier General. Benjamin Davis Jr. Uh, had been bumped up in the rank a couple of times, but here he was as his you know, the chief of staff for his dad. But all this is happening at practically the same time that uh, Eleanor had her ride and went home and started poking Franklin in the ribs. So, all of a sudden, after uh, 
Well, he graduated in 32, so we're up to 1941. Well, actually, late 40, going into 41. Um, he gets a letter, even though he'd been pestering to get into the Army flight program since 32, he finally gets this letter and opens it up and says, you and 12 others are to report to Tuskegee Institute uh, to start flying. It's going to become Tuskegee Army Airfield. So all of a sudden he was in. He gets down there, they're building the field, everything starts getting together and everything. The first group of 13, which he is the highest rank, uh, the only officer of the group at that point, um, so he's put in charge of the whole thing. Uh, things were a little rough at that point, and eventually five of them graduated, got their wins. But he saw September 2nd, September 2nd of 1941, so it was before Pearl Harbor. And the five of them got their wings in March of 42. And at that point, things were beginning to go the proper way. Uh, the first CO that they had down there wasn't really into the program. There was a lot of the military that was still just eager to see the whole thing fail and rid themselves of the whole idea. But then a Colonel Parrish was put in charge down there. And Colonel Parrish just saw everybody as his guys and wanted his guys to do really well. So from that point on, things started going better with everything. Um, he was really behind the guys. Uh, after they started graduating more and more of the guys, the guys getting wings, uh, the idea was to get an entire squadron strength, which would be the 99th Fighter Squadron, and then get them into combat. They got trained, they got their wings, they got more training, they got more training. They were boring holes through the sky around Alabama for a year because the military didn't know what to do with them at that point. So finally, uh, with a lot of pressure, they were sent over to North Africa. They were put into this other unit as their own squadron, but it's kind of tagging along type. Just follow us, don't come to the briefings, just follow along with us. <clears throat> so that was only, you know, marginally successful because they were only beginning, you know, given marginal chance to do stuff. Uh, the next group that they were put into a few months later, things were improving a little bit. They finally got put with a group where the CEO of the unit put them on an equal status with everybody else and wanted everybody to do well and looked out after everybody. And with that whole attitude, they started to do better and better. And on one day, uh, Charles Hall, Lieutenant Charles Hall, got into a little dogfight and shot down a German. And that kind of set the stage for everything. They finally got a victory. At this point, a lot of what they were doing was ground support, ground attack, that type of thing. Um, that didn't give you that much opportunity for air-to-air -air combat, fighting Messerschmitts or Focke-Wolfs or something. But then the other squadrons that became the Tuskegee Airmen with the 99th became up to ready status. They came over. They all got their own airfield for the 332nd Fighter Group at Ramatelli, Italy. And at this point, they became an entire fighting wing. That's when they got the Mustangs. That's when the red tail started to happen. And I'm going to look at my notes or I'll get this wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, their, their whole mission changed at that point from ground attack, ground support and everything, to escorting the bombers. Benjamin Odinus was their CEO, and he always told them that your job is to protect the bombers. There's 10 guys, 10 crewmen in each one of those bombers. Your job is to get them back. Your job is not to go out uh, seeking your personal glory. If I ever hear of you going out chasing a German to get a victory that you can paint on the side of your airplane, it's the last time you're going to fly in the Army Air Corps. So don't do it. So um, a week after they started switching over to the P-51s, Captain Joseph Ellsbury uh, just happened to be in the right place at the right time and shot down three Focke-Wolf 190s. So things were beginning to happen in the right way. Uh, very shortly after that, Clarence Lucky Lester shot down three more. Uh, on that same day that Lucky Lester got his, they got a total of 11. 
And this is while they're protecting the bombers. Uh, I have a thing here that was stated by one of the bomber pilots. He said that the P-38 groups, the P-38s always stayed too far out. They were too far out to really protect the bombers properly. Most of the P-51 groups tended to stay too close so they didn't have maneuver room. Uh, the other groups just wanted to go off and shoot down Germans. But the red tails were the ones that always stayed exactly where they needed to be to protect the bombers. Consequently, the biggest legacy combat-wise of the Tuskegee Airmen, the 332nd Fighter Group, is they never lost a bomber that they were escorting to an enemy fighter. They couldn't do anything about the flak coming up, obviously, but a fighter never got in to shoot down one of the bombers that they were protecting. And then, uh, to kind of culminate the whole thing, in March of 45, at this point they had a, master, uh, a very good record, but Colonel Davis led the whole 332nd on the longest mission ever flown by a 15th Air Force fighter group, and that was to escort the bombers all the way to Berlin and back. So it was you know, a very, very long day, but they successfully did that. A lot of people don't realize that the target there for all you Mercedes-Benz owners, it was the Daniel Benz plant. It got successfully hit, so let's set back Mercedes-Benz for a little bit. Uh, there's a whole lot more involved with all of this. Uh, there's all kinds of records they, they set. Uh, 15,000 combat sorties were flown by them. 111 German airplanes were shot down. Uh, two of their guys just happened to be at the right place at the right time. They were actually, I think, five airplanes and they were Thunderbolts, like Rusty flew. Uh, they were flying back from a, a mission over the Adriatic. And they just happened to look down, and here's a German destroyer. They went, oh, it's too good to pass up. They still had most of their ammunition. So they started diving at it. And uh, Wendell Pruitt and, what's the other guy's name? Preston, yeah. They're the guys whose bullets did it. They only had their 50 caliber machine gun bullets. There were no bombs involved or anything. Just eight 50 caliber machine guns. And I think it was on the third pass, all of a sudden, this German destroyer blows up, breaks in half, and sinks. It's the largest ship ever sunk just with machine gun fire. So they, they amassed an amazing record, and we all know that it set the stage for what was to come later with uh, desegregation. It gave the Air Force, when the Air Force became the Air Force in 1947, a leg up on all the rest of the branches of the military on desegregation. And there's a whole lot more to the story. And what I'm going to do now, for the rest of the story, is turn it over to Rusty Burns. And uh, then we will open it up if you have any questions for him. And when Rusty is done, before the airplanes fly, I'm going to have JD, wherever he is, come up. Oh, he's over back there. And brief you as to what you'll like to be expected to see out there when the airplanes are flying. So, if I forget when Rusty's done, remind me to have JD come up here. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Stan. Uh, I'm thinking seriously about cutting his hair off and putting a little black on his face and letting him do the story. He does it very well. <laughs> Stan is kind of sort of taking you through the, the early stages, the struggle, uh, the people who helped us, uh, the accomplishments. I'm going to just kind of briefly go through those uh, and start speaking to you about what happened after the war and bring you up to date as to where we are uh, today. Okay, so one of the things uh, that uh, Stan mentioned was the, the mission to Berlin where the uh, the P-51 flew uh, bomber escort. There's a story that I've never told before that I, I would like to tell you about that mission before I get started. We have a captain by the name of Omar Blair. Omar was about six feet eight and he weighed about 280 pounds and he had a voice like Paul Rolson. And he was, he was uh, a very, very strong person. Anyway, when it came time to make this mission, uh, we were short. The, 332nd was short long-range tanks, and they couldn't make the mission without the long-range tanks. 
So they uh, called headquarters and ordered some long-range tanks, and they were told, we don't have any left. The last ones we had, we just shipped to some outfit north of you, and we don't have any more left. Well, they shouldn't have told him where they were going because Omar went, confiscated a couple of uh, semis and, a, and, a, and a, a hoist, and he uh, stopped the train, robbed this, it's called the, the train robbery. Stopped the train, <laughs> took the tanks they needed, brought them back to the base, put them on the airplanes, and the, and the 332nd flew the mission successfully. This is what we call the great train robbery. <laughs> The last time I spoke, I mentioned the people who had helped us, and they were tremendous. I'd like to go back and start off with the beginning of the uh, attempt to become uh, military pilots. I'll go back to 1925 because I have a neighbor who likes to hear this particular story, and where the War College was commissioned to do a study on the feasibility of blacks flying military airplanes. Big, big study, and the bottom line was they decided that blacks lacked the intelligence, the courage, and the manual dexterity to fly combat airplanes. Now this is 1925 and that lasted for quite a while. We got up into 1935 when the CPT program, which Dan mentioned, and we successfully entered that program. But we had a lot of help. In doing so, we had a gentleman by the name of Walter White, who was head of the NAACP, a gentleman who was head of the Portland Reporters Unit called A. Philip Randolph. We had a judge by the name of William Hastie. We had a senator by the name of uh, uh, Harry Truman. Uh, we had the head, uh, the publishers of the, of the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier, the presidents of, of, of the universities who wanted, who wanted to have this uh, program for themselves, who helped to get the CPT program started successfully in the late 30s. Then we had the beginning of the attempt to become fighter pilots. And there was a struggle there. The same people were involved, uh, Walter White, A. Philip Randolph, Judge William Hastings, uh, the uh, uh, Senator Truman, who was still there. But we also had a gentleman who happened to be a classmate of mine later on in years. His name was uh, Nancy Williams. Nancy sued the federal government in 19, January 1941 for discrimination. This was a key into the, trend, into the approval of the program. He and Eleanor Roosevelt, more than anyone else, were responsible for the successful uh, start of the Tuskegee Airmen program by executive order, Franklin Roosevelt signed it right after, as Stan said, Eleanor went back to Washington. She did what wives do best. She convinced her husband that he ought to start this program, which he did. The, the, the success of the program, we went through the years of 42, of March of 1942 until March of 1946. The program went through all that time. During that period, we graduated 996, 900, and 94 were Americans. Four of them were from the Caribbean islands. 450 of them went overseas. 66 of them died overseas. I'm giving you a little of the, of the statistics now. They shot down 136 airplanes they, uh, in the air. They destroyed another 273 on the ground. They destroyed 127 locomotives. Now, most people don't think that locomotives are very, are very glorified. But when you think of what the locomotive does, it supports the troops, it supports the, the brings in fuel, brings in ammunition, brings in food. Without, without the, the, the logistics, why well, your, your army is not going to survive. So they did a very good job of destroying the trains and the locomotives, which helped to furnish, uh, to furnish the enemy. As Stan said, they flew 1,578 uh, missions, 15,553 sorties. Uh, sorties is when you go out with nothing on your mind, you're just looking for trouble. You're not necessarily, you don't have a, a mission, you don't have a destination, you know, nothing to find. You just go out looking for trouble. That's called a sortie. For their efforts, the, the Tuskegee Airmen received one Legion of Merit, one Silver Star, two Soldiers Medals, eight Purple Hearts, 14 brown stars, 744 distinguished flying crosses, 744 air medals with, with Oak Leafs customers, and one presidential citation. And that's not the end of it, because as I get on here, I'm going to give you some more of, uh, of, of what they, they have done. Now I'd like to take you to the end of the war. We know the struggle that happened before, but now I'm going to take you to the end of the war. The war is over. 
our guys come home. Some of the people who went to war came home to ticker tape parades in New York. Our guys did it. They came home, they not only didn't have a ticker tape parade, but they found that businesses at home was business as usual. We still couldn't drink from fountains, we still couldn't go in the restroom, we couldn't get a room in a hotel. We had to ride on the front of the train and the back of the bus. All the things that we left, the Jim Crow, was still here when our guys came home. So there was a period of time when nothing really happened, uh, nothing good really happened for the, for the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. In 1948, then President Truman desegregated the services, which was primarily because of the exploits of the Tuskegee Airmen, along with the other uh, guys that, that did the, 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 the grunt work on the ground, which was a good thing. However, it didn't really, they deactivated the 332nd, which was stationed at Columbus, Ohio at the time, and all of our guys who were still in the service, I was out by now, all of our guys who were still in the service were similarly around in the various uh, uh, other uh, flight services, other air, air uh, fields. This didn't really solve the problem because we have, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So we still suffered uh, a bit from after immigration. We found a lot of our guys, when you take a flight check, or flight physical rather, suddenly developed anomalies that they didn't have before, infirmities rather, that they didn't have before. So a lot of our guys were failing flight uh, physicals and getting out of the service. So not too many of them stayed in, in the service. So integration didn't do a lot for the first few years. We went about 30 years after the war when not much happened for uh, the, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. And then things began to happen. 1978, the first exposure we really got, nobody really knew about Tuskegee Airmen until then. We didn't know about Tuskegee Airmen until then. But in 1978, there was a program entitled We the People. Some of you may be old enough to remember We the People. It was hosted by John Barber, Sarah Purcell, and a fellow by the name of Byron Allen. They brought five of our guys onto the program. Now, this is national television. Five Tuskegee, original Tuskegee Airmen, were interviewed on national television in 1978. And that was the beginning of exposure. Things began to happen now. We began to get requests for appearances. We began to get uh, requests for speaking engagements. People began to, to take notice of the fact that we did exist, much the same as you folks do here. It began to be a positive experience. Uh, after that, Bill uh, uh, Davis got his fourth star from, from I believe, President Kent Clinton. Bob Williams wrote, uh, wrote the movie, The Tuskegee Airmen, which he, as, as uh, Stan said, it took him 30 years to find somebody to, to publish it. War wasn't very popular with Columbus, Columbus, Columbia Studios because it was owned by Asian Pacific people. So they, they weren't looking for any war stories, so Bob had a tough time. If it wasn't for Cooper and HBO, we probably would still be looking for, uh, we would still be looking for the movie. But he did write the movie, I mean he did produce the movie, it's showing even as of now. And it gives a good, uh, a good depiction of, what, in, a, in a small scale, of what happened at T Tuskegee. There are three events, two events particularly, that I like to mention in that movie. And I usually do them when I'm speaking. I show snippets of them. The first one was Colonel Parrish giving Captain You Know Who Hell for having used a, a, a racial uh, epithet. And uh, he let him know, in the movie does this, he let him know in no terms that he would not tolerate that sort of thing. And that's the kind of a man Colonel Will Parrish was. The second one was the actor who prayed, who prayed uh, Colonel Davis at the time, Bill Davis, did a job of Davis's plea to Congress. Uh, one of the commanders in the Pacific, when the 99th first went over, uh, Colonel Momai was his name, didn't take kindly to the Tuskegee Airmen being there, the 99th being there. And he wrote a, a blistering letter to the heads of, uh, of the Army at the time, de uh, denouncing the ability, I'll put it that way, of the Tuskegee Airmen. 
He said they couldn't fly formation. They were scared. Every time the enemy showed up, they would run. It was a very, very, very bad letter. However, the, the Congress knew that the Tuskegee Airmen of uh, the 99th didn't have a chance to do any of these things because all he had to do was flying up and down the Mediterranean coast looking at fishing. So Davis went to Congress and he gave this speech. And if you haven't seen it, pay attention. It is uh, the most eloquent uh, presentation I have ever seen. Congress heard him, decided that he was that he was right in asking for a fair shake, changed from Umar to a colonel by the name of Keyes, who took the 99th in and gave them a chance to become what they, what they eventually ended up. The uh, reestablishment of the 332nd Fighter Group, the, as a part of, of recognition for Tuskegee Airmen, the Air Force recently reassigned re the 332nd Fighter Group, not a fighter group, excuse me, the 332nd Air Expeditionary Forces. They are currently assigned in battle in Iraq, and some of our guys had an opportunity to go over and meet with them and to uh, in, in enjoy their time. The, the next event that I'd like to mention is we have one of our, one of our members, a twin engine pilot, and what we call the Freeman Field Mutiny. You may have heard of the Freeman Field Mutiny. This was an occasion during the war where our twin engine guys, of which we got one right sitting right over there, Mitch, uh, were at uh, Freeman Field and decided to desegregate the officers' club. Uh, they, they undertook to, they, in fours, they would march to the officers' club. Well, the, the colonel who ran the base knew about it. So what he did was he stationed the provost marshal right at the door. So as our guys got there, the provost marshal turned them around and sent them back. Well, my good friend Bill Terry decided he wasn't going to be turned around and go back. So he kind of shoved the provost marshal aside and went into the officer's club. Well, of all the 101 who got charged, he is the only one who, got, who was found guilty of uh, felony assault. This carried through him for his entire life until a few years back. And I may get this wrong, I'm not sure who the president was. I think it was Clinton who pardoned Bill Terry 50 some years after the event occurred, uh, one of the presidents pardoned Bill Terry. Then this year, things really began to happen. And this has been probably the busiest year that I have had. And I will, I will start you off. In October, I got an invitation to the Pentagon and to, to be the guest, of, a luncheon guest of Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Well, my politics being what it is, and my and my my desire not to be a, a, a hypocrite, I had some thoughts about whether I should attend or not. I finally accepted the invitation, and I went to with my wife. I went to Washington D.C. as a guest of Donald Rumsfeld, and we had a lunch. We had a briefing by by General Casey on the state of the of military services today. We had another briefing by General Conway on what they intend to do or what they'd like to do in Iraq. Beyond that, we had lunch with Rumsfeld. I found the man to be just actually absolutely charming. We didn't talk politics, we didn't talk war. We talked about careers, we talked about Tuskegee Airmen. We talked, he's a Navy pilot, so we talked about flying. And you know how when pilots get to talk about flying, so we had a, 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 a lot of conversation about flying. But it was a very, very good experience. And his purpose of bringing us there was to demonstrate his respect for the Tuskegee Airmen. He knew Tuskegee Airmen because he and Chappie James, if I can get this thing to work, Chappie's up there, let's see there. He's up there standing with him, hanging on to the prop. That's Chappie James up there, who was our first four star general, incidentally. He and Chappie James were good buddies who were, so he knew of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, I thought I'd Things were going on well. Then I got another invitation. In uh, December, I got an invitation from Tuskegee, which used to be an institute, which is now a university. I got an invitation for a convocation there. They were going to confer upon all of us who could get there, all the single engine fighter pilots who could get there. They were going to bestow, bestow a, degree, a doctor's degree in public service, which we did on the 20th. 3rd of, of February, we went to Tuskegee, it was quite an event. 
57 fighter pilots. Now, we've had this question for years, how many of us are there left? We still don't know how many twin-engine pilots we got left, but I have a fair idea of how many single-engine pilots. There were two guys from the second class. All four guys in the first class had passed on. But there were two guys from the second class still alive. One was in a wheelchair, and the other one was running around, around like he was 20 years old. Right? It's unbelievable. <laughs> he was about just about so big, his name was Clarence Jameson. Anyway, there were 57 of us, and I know of at least 15 that were unable to attend for various reasons of infirmity, uh, the things that we get when we get old. So I imagine there's somewhere around you know, 75 or 80 of the, nine, of the 650 single engine pilots. There's somewhere around 75 or 80 of them still left in various degrees. Now there were two wheelchairs, four walkers, uh, one pair of crutches, and about a dozen canes. Yeah. But they all, all except two of them made it up to the stage and received their, their degree. Well, with that, I thought I'd die and go to heaven. You know, I've, I've, the, everything is going along real great. But there's more to come. Oh, a while back, Congressman Charlie Mangle of New York introduced the bill, 12, H.R. 1259, in Congress. It was a bill that required signatures to pass. They didn't hold a vote. They passed the bill around and got all the senators that wanted to, to sign it. When they got to the two-thirds two majority that they required, the bill was considered passed and they pushed it off to the Senate. It got to the Senate and a, a senator by the name of Carl Levin from Michigan took over. He ran it through the, and this went very quickly, he ran it through the Senate uh, in a very short period of time, it was 99 to nothing. I think somebody didn't show up that day. But they passed the Senate 99 to nothing. On the 14th of April, at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. in the morning, this year, our Lord, President Bush signed H.R. 1259. And what it did, it conferred upon all the Tuskegee Airmen, not just the pilots, everybody who, I'm sorry, take it back, something else, something else. It conferred upon the 994 pilots who graduated in Tuskegee from class 42C to class 46C, the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor. Now that is something. I'd like to put that into perspective for you. The first one went to George Washington. And as a whole, there's a whole bunch of people down the line that I, I won't go the name. There was the largest group up to us was nine. Somebody called the group of nine. And I meant to look it up, but I don't really remember uh, 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 what it was they did. I had a feeling they did something with civil rights, but I'm not sure. But to this point, Tuskegee Airmen is the largest group ever to receive the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor. The medal is 15 ounces of gold. It will be, for the sake of, of having a, a, a famous place to put it, it will be uh, displayed in the, in the Tuskegee Airmen display at the Smithsonian Institute, Institution uh, in the Air and Space Museum. So if you want to see the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor for the Tuskegee Airmen, that's where it will be. We'll be able to get it when we need it if we want to display it from time to time. But that's where that will be its permanent location. Uh, there's something else I got with that. There's such a oh. The oh, gold medal, the gold medal. I lost my train of thought there. I think I covered everything I wanted to cover. Uh, getting back to to make my my neighbor happy, I, I have to say, all of this, it's not too shabby for a group of guys who lack the courage, the uh, intelligence and the manual dexterity to fly combat airplanes. Dick, wherever you are, thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you all for, for coming. We really appreciate your, your support and your, co and your cooperation. We've had this for years, particularly here there at the Palm Springs Museum. Uh, have been very responsive to uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. So I say to you now, God bless you all. God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Rusty. He's always good. And personally, he's a great guy, too, as they all are. So, you know, they're wonderful people. Uh, one thing I want to do is mention that Mayor Ron Oden is with us today. He's, oh, I see him back there. Hey, Ron. He's always been very supportive of the whole thing. And the other thing I want to do is thank the Voices of Calvary Gospel Choir. Because every time they come and join us and sing, they blow us away. They've got wonderful voices, and we thank all of you tremendously. So, one thing, JD's got to come up first. So we're going to have JD, JD, do you want to, don't be shy. Just make it real quick. <laughs> all right, the mission for today, uh, part of our program here at the museum, not only to introduce and, and make uh, people like the Tuskegee Airmen available to everybody while they're still here to share their, their very important role with us, is to, to demonstrate the, the airplanes. So, uh, I just recently finished a book called The Mutiny at Freeman Field, uh, which we just heard the story of a little bit. So we decided that uh, in honor of the, uh, the multi-engine guys from the Tuskegee program, that we'd fly the B-25 today, uh, which is what they were getting ready to do combat in. To also demonstrate the role that the Tuskegee Airmen did for us during the war, uh, they flew a very important role, which was bomber escort. So with that in mind, uh, Hank Reichert's going to join us doing bomber escort in the B-51. So we'll have a flight of two of the B-25 with a fighter escort, the P-51. So that's the mission for today.